So this is the last of our four sessions on angels and scriptures. And this, as Kevin has mentioned, is on the patriarchs. And we will stick exclusively with the patriarchs. Question to start with, though. When you look at the angels' interaction with the patriarchs, it seems as if there's an anomaly. Because there's quite a fair amount of interaction with Abram. And we can, we're going to look at a little bit of that. A lot of interaction with Jacob. Is there any interaction with Isaac? If you can see any, please tell me, because I can't see any. So if that's the case, why would that be the case? That, you know, this being, you know, the patriarchal family, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, all bound up in the promises of the Father and in the name of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Why is it that Isaac is left out of the interaction with the angels? And as a genuine question, um, so that perhaps we can discuss it afterwards. I mean, I've got a few thoughts, but uh, no scriptures really to back that up. So what I want to do to start off with is go to Exodus 23, and then we'll go to Genesis and see some of those instances where the angels met with Abraham and with Jacob. So we've got Exodus 23, verse 20. The reason why God sent an angel before Israel. We're told there in Exodus 23, verse 20, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. So God says you've got an angel that's specific to you, going to go before you to do two things. One, to keep you in the way because you're on a journey, so you're going to be kept on that journey and to be brought in the end to the place which I've prepared. So God says, your angel is to keep you on the way so that in the end you'll be bring to the place that I've prepared for you. And verse 21 says, you have to have a great respect for him, beware of him and obey his voice and so on. And make sure you don't uh, transgress against my name because he's that special name bearing angel. But let's go back to see that that, that same phrase that that same promise was made to Jacob in Genesis chapter 28 so here is Jacob the father of course of all Israel and that very same promise was made to him so Genesis 28 we just took it for our reading it's the place where often it's called you know the, 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 the stairway to heaven the ladder and the angels were ascending and descending there and at that time says in verse 15, what does God say? Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. It's the same promise. So Jacob, I'll be with you. The angel will go before you. That's what God said to Israel. I'll keep you and I'll, be, I'll bring you again into this land. The land which I promised you, I haven't got it yet, but I'll bring you into this land for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to the of. so that's where it began God says the angels are with you keeping you and to bring you to the promised land the destination that God has for Jacob for Israel for all his family and that's repeated in Exodus and that's how we have to look at the ministration of the angels which our Lord Jesus spoke to us of the angels are here amongst us to do that very thing for us to keep us in the way on our journey, however short or long it might be as we wait for our master's return, so that we might inherit that place which God has prepared for us. And that's a very wonderful thing if we think that God has done that for us. He says, you have that blessing to keep you in the way, to bring you into the land. And we have looked at this before in our studies, but let's just remind ourselves what Jesus said about that in Matthew chapter 18. Because it gives us the dimension we should think about when we think about the angels. It's not just about us. This is about God manifestation. This is about God declaring his character and how we respond to it. So let's remind ourselves, what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 18? Verse 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. He's just gone repeatedly, uh, chapter 18, talking of 
uh, you know, little child that comes into the midst of them in verse 2. And you've got to become as little children, verse 3. It's the whole uh, emphasis of this section is about the little children. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. And that's why this is one of the verses we can go to to, to really show us that uh, I think we do have personal angels. So when we look at that in uh, Genesis and Exodus, that Israel had a specific angel to keep them on the way and to take them into that promised land, so do we. And Jesus says, you have that. But what does that mean? How are we to respond to that? Because we're to think about it in these terms. Jesus says, imagine now your heavenly father has given each of you, you and your brothers and sisters, a personal angel. So you don't despise one another. This is God manifestation in action. If God has been so merciful to us as to give us a personal angel to keep us in the way, and we'll talk about what we think that means later, and, and to bring us to the kingdom, how dare we despise one another? So we're to take God's character in giving us an angel and apply it to how we treat our brothers and sisters. Jesus says, do you really think it would be acceptable for you to despise your own brothers and sisters, God having given them, an angel to keep them and to bring them to the kingdom. And as one brother put it, imagine the scene in, the, in, in heaven where an angel comes and says, I'm trying to do a, a, a lot of work with, with uh, the saint that you've given me. But there's a brother or a sister that's making it very difficult for me. He or she is putting a lot of stumbling blocks in front of the saint that I'm trying to bring on the way to bring to the kingdom. Imagine if that was a report given of our behaviour to our brothers and sisters. That would be awful, wouldn't it? And so Jesus says, take heed, be very careful, because God has afforded us such a privilege. That's his character. So you need to manifest that character to your brothers and sisters, because those very angels behold the face of our Father in heaven. And we know, we looked at that too, Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encampeth around those that fear him. We went to Kings where Elisha in Dothan opened the eyes of the lad so that he could see a huge host and he was shown there's more with us than there are with them. If only our eyes could be opened. They can only be opened through the eyes of faith. If there were angels amongst us this evening, the scriptures teach us there most surely must be, but we must only see them with the eye of faith. And we can look at some of the patriarchs, how they behaved when they did meet the angels. So with that in mind, and that thinking that we, we, this, this subject is about how God has blessed us, but then how we apply that in our lives to our brothers and sisters. Let's look at Genesis chapter 18. You have that occasion where the Lord appeared unto Abraham. Yahweh manifested himself. He, he's made himself plain. This is God's manifestation before Abraham in the plains of Mamre in the heat of the day and you can imagine there Abraham in heat of the day in the door of his tent and he lifted up his eyes in Genesis 18 verse 2 and lo there were three men that stood by him and we know how his behavior was to them he ran to meet them he was so hospitable he bowed before them and we know that there were two classes of angels in that group for there we have in verse 9, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. So there was a class of those angels, two of them. They said unto him, Where's Sarah? But there's another angel, and he speaks in very different terms. Verse 14, now this verse, see verse 13, And Yahweh said unto Abraham. So there's one angel here who, when he speaks, speaks as if he's God. And we've looked at that earlier in our studies. That can be none other than the name-bearing angel, that one that went for them in the wilderness, Michael, he who was like God. So that's how he speaks. He speaks in the first person. Other angels says, thus saith the Lord. This angel speaks as if he's God himself. Yahweh said unto Abram, wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I of a surety bear child when I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee. So he speaks in the first person, called to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So you've got 
that hierarchy of the angels which we've spoken about earlier, there were two others there with the name-bearing angel who speaks as if he's God himself. And we get an insight into the mind of the servants, the immortal servants of God, because it says that the men rose up, verse 16, and they looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And verse 17, Yahweh said, the Lord said, the angel of the name of God said, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed with him. I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of to him. Because of Abraham's attitude, because of his manner of life and because he would teach his household the ways of the Lord, the angel says, I will not hide from him the thing which I'm going to do. And we know the record tells how the angel then explains to Abraham what is to be done to Sodom and Gomorrah. And verse 22 says, And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before Yahweh. There he is in the presence of this name-bearing angel as if it's God himself. And you have this situation where in the mercy of God, this angel is able to have a conversation with Abraham about how many could be saved from Sodom. An account which you know we can we can say to ourselves, this is almost too hard to imagine that a man could barter with God. And yet, this is a faithful man. This is a man who's described as the friend of God. And so he was able to say, per adventure, if there be 40, if there be 30, if in the end there be 10. And in the end, verse 33, the Lord went his way. There's the angel, he went his way. As soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So God sent that name-bearing angel. And look at the wonder of God's servants. They want to interact with us, to help us to understand the work that they are doing. And chapter 19 gives us that most wonderful and terrible record of what happens to Sodom. Let's go in at verse 15. It says, after those events with Lot's family, when the morning arose... Then the angels hastened Lot. Look at the love they have got for God's servants. <clears throat> Hurry up, Lot, because destruction is coming. Arise, take your wife and your daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Imagine if that is how our angel is working with us today. How long will it be ere our Lord return? We know not. We may fall asleep before he returns. We, haven't, we don't know whether we've got tomorrow to live, none of us. But imagine if our angels are working with us. You're going the wrong way. Hurry up, come back, lest you be consumed with the iniquity or the punishment of the city. God in his love says, I've sent my angel to keep you in the way, to bring you to the place which I prepared. And surely there must be occasions when our angels have to do that. But they lingered, verse 16, and while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, Yahweh being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. Look at the mercy of God. In the judgment he was bringing on that city, hurry up. But he lingered. So they were grabbed by the hands and brought out the Lord being merciful. And that is the ministration of the angels for us. God is merciful that he's given them to us, though we see them not. But how often do we push back against them, keeping us in the way? The Lord being so merciful to us and we hinder and we delay the things that we know we ought to do. And how will our angel give account of us when he says to the father, I'm trying very hard. He's hindering, he's, he's, he's not being quick to come back. He doesn't know the time is short. He's forgotten. So it does us good to remember that it, God in his mercy has given us this and we have to respond. So what I want to do now is focus on specifically on Jacob because of what I think he represents and of the peculiarity of what happens to him with the angels. Perhaps you know, the most obvious person that jumps to mind because of some of the instances with Jacob's ladder and wrestling with an angel and so on. Jacob jumps out the scriptures at us. And yet in all of Jacob's difficulties, let's turn to Genesis 28 again. 
the angels are with him. Does that mean he had an easy time of it? This angel that was promised to keep him in the way, to walk with him. Let's just go in at verse 12 of Genesis 28. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth. The top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angel of God ascending and descended upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And he said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac, the land where thou liest. To thee will I give it to thy seed. There's a promised land. And I'm going to keep you, verse 15, in all the places where you go. And I will bring you into that land which I promised to you. After this event, you know how long it was before Jacob even had any recorded interaction with an angel again? 40 years. Now we say to ourselves, look, we've never seen an angel. And if we have met them, as Hebrews records, we don't know it for sure. We've never seen the miraculous hand of God. And it's so hard sometimes to see it and to, to say if only once we could see it for certain. But here's a man who had 40 year period. He'd been promised. He, had, he was exiled then for 40 years. He was in fear of his brother. We know that he thought his brother was going to kill him and all his family. He had to leave home and never see his mother again. He had immoral sons. The things that are recorded of their behaviour was unacceptable of a saint of the Lord. They reformed, but what a challenge that was to Jacob. He had violent sons. They made his name to stink, it says, before the Canaanites because of their violence. And then he lost Joseph. He was restored to him, but his brothers saw the, the severe loss and they said, we can't put him through that again. And so we say to ourselves, does the angel keeping us in the way, preparing us to enter into the kingdom, mean we don't have difficulties? Of course not. The patriarchs are great proof enough of that. Look at all the difficulties they had. But Jacob's summary at the end of Genesis is wonderful of how he looks at what God has done for him with this angel. It was not an avoidance of all the great trials and tribulations of life. And he could have said, couldn't he, of those 40 years, where's the promise that God gave me? He told me that he'd be an angel with me all the time, keeping me in the places that I would go. He wouldn't leave me and he's going to bring me again to the land. 40 years it's been. What was his attitude? Let's have a look, just flick forward to Genesis 31. This is how he thought about that 40-year period. Genesis 31, and we know of all the difficulties he went through and of Laban's uh, deceitful nature with him, changing his wages and making life so difficult for him and his family. Genesis 31, verse 5, Jacob says, I see your father's countenance. It's not toward me before, as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. So he never says, I'm, 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 I'm wondering now whether God is with me because I've had a terrible 40 years and I was given a promise and I'm not quite sure. I'm just doubting it. And we, we might say to ourselves, well, we could forgive him that, a doubt, couldn't we? Because we think of ourselves. But here, what a faithful man. The God of my father has been with me through all of those troubles and difficulties. You know, being given one wife and he thought he was marrying another. And it went downhill from there. My father has been with me. And you know that with all my power I've served your father. And your father deceived me and changed my wages these ten times. But God suffered him not to hurt me. God was with me. And what's more, God wouldn't let Laban hurt me beyond what God wanted. And so he knew God was in complete control. God keeps us in peace, peace, if our mind is stayed on him. That's the scripture's teaching. Here's a man who really does feel that in all his difficulties, God, he says, I know God was with me. It's been tough, but it's not been what God didn't want. God was with me and he was with Laban, who was afflicting me and deceiving me. For 40 years, the faith of that man was not dimmed. And then that 40 year silence is ended in verse 11. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream saying, Jacob, and I said, here am I. And he said, lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle, a ring straight speckled and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban done unto thee. God does say, you're right. I've seen it all. I'm the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar 
where thou vowest to vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land, and return to the land of thy kindred. Now's the time. I've kept you in the way, I've been with you all the time. Now's the time to come back. What a time that will be when we get the call. I have seen it all. I saw all the difficulties you went through in your life. I saw all the challenges you faced with your children and with your family life and with your employer and with your health. And I saw it all. I saw your faithfulness. Now come. Now is the time to come into the promised land. And so there he goes to return to the land. But once again, that wasn't just it, what he did in this section. Look what he does in verse 24. And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and says unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. So we, we think of the ministrations of the angels very much in they're looking after us, doing that which is good. But the point was made, I think, by Brother Ian in our discussion last week was that God is the author of evil as well. And we know that doesn't mean bad things, breaking God's commands, of course. But he's the author of things that are against those who are against him. Things which he wouldn't describe as good or comforting. And so he says to Laban, you don't touch Jacob. You don't say anything good or bad to him. And that is the ministrations of God. And we never see that. How would we know if, if the angels are administered to one of our employers? Sometimes we think, wouldn't that be lovely? But we wouldn't know, would we? But yet God is there to keep us in the way, both with us and with those who interact with us. What an incredible situation that Jacob went through. And so he went from that point and he went to go into the promised land. And Genesis 32, as Jacob went on his way, he's still being kept in the way. And very explicitly, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. Unlike uh, Abraham in Genesis 18 where it says they were men but demonstrably we, we see they were angels and it's quoted elsewhere in scripture here they're called the angels, the malachim the, the, the messengers of God and when Jacob saw them he said this is God's host that's what he thought of the angels this is God's army and that's how we must think of them like that boy, Elisha's servant in, in, in Dothan we've got to see with the eye of faith and say wherever we are whatever difficulties we face we say God's army is here, and we have to see them with the eye of faith. How right he was. This army, this great company of angels, encampeth around those that fear the Lord. And then he called the name of that place Mahanaim, which our margins tell us means two companies. Which two companies? Of which two companies does he speak? Jacob is travelling with his family so that might be one company but who is the other some have suggested that Jacob is referring to the angels of God that met him it doesn't say how many but there was a group at least two of angels that met him is that the other camp I wonder about that myself because if you know we know that Psalm 34 says the angels of the Lord encamp around those that fear him you'd expect only one camp wouldn't you You'd expect him to say, one camp. You know, not Machaneim, but just Machane. Like, you know, it's just one camp. But no, he tells it two camps. Who is the second camp? I struggle, I've got to be honest, with the idea that this is Jacob's family and the angels. I think this is a faithful man who would have understood that they were one camp together. So if that is the case, then let's discuss it. Who would be the other camp? Is it Laban's household who've been warned? to stay away from Jacob is it them representing all others who are not with this host is Jacob saying here's the host of God we're either with that camp or within the other camp or is it a reference to Esau's camp which comes afterwards in the narrative that's the second question we can have in discussion but let's just move on at that point because verse 3 says Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau his brother and to the land of Seir, to the country of Edom. So there's Jacob, who goes out and he says, I've got to send messages to my brother. And how does he feel at this point? Verse 7, Jacob is greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that were with him into two companies. And that's the same word 
uh, camp, two camps that he says in verse 32. Is that a reference to what he means, that there's two camps? But that's what he does. And here's an individual who's had personal interactions with the angels. He knows God's been with him. Does that mean he's not afraid? He's greatly afraid and distressed. He's extremely emotional about the fear he has of meeting his own brother. And he says in verse 10, I'm not worthy of the least of all thy mercies, of all the truth which thou hast shown to thy servant. With my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I'm become two companies. Has he been drawing a reference earlier to the fact that he knew he was going to divide his family to those perhaps he loved more? And he says, now I'm being divided, and he shouldn't be. He should be one camp with the angels in the one host of God. One and the same, though you can't even see them, they should be part of your camp. But now he's divided himself because he's greatly afraid. How would you or I have behaved? And so he says, verse 11, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And we have in our margins what that really means. The mother upon the children. He's got in his mind's eye that his brother's going to kill his family and pile them up. What a horrendous thing. And you can imagine his great fear and distress. And so he's praying that God would deliver him out of this terrible situation. And then he says in verse, let's go down to verse 20. This is what he's saying to those who go before. This is what you've got to say, Jacob says. And say ye moreover, behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he'll accept of me. That's a pretty awful translation. So please check it for yourself. But Young's little translation shows what is going on in that verse 20. This is what he says. I've slightly adjusted it, but uh, I think it's still accurate. He actually says, I will cover his face with the present that is going before my face. And afterwards I see his face, it may be he lifteth up my face. So in the Hebrew, and some of some versions will have it more accurately, and your a margin might show, four times is the reference to the face. Jacob says, I'll cover his face with the presence going before my face, and afterwards I see his face, it may be he lifteth up my face. So Jacob is consumed with what's there in front of him, not with what he can't see but with what he can see. He's in a terrible situation. He's said a prayer and he's all consumed with his face and his brother's face, his face and his brother's face. And it may be that he will lift up my face. And that's the interaction between those two sons of one of the patriarchs. And you see his preoccupation is with what is happening right there and right then. And he's not thinking about God. And we'll see that in a moment because of what he says at the end of this chapter. But before we get to that, what happens? After he said that he hopes that would happen, he has to lodge and stay the night. And once again, in the night time, just like before, when he'd rested his head and Jacob's ladder was seen, again, he rose up in the night and he passed over the ford Jabbok and he took them and sent them over the brook and sent them over that he had. And Jacob was there alone, on his own. And the narrative says, just out of nowhere, he starts wrestling with a man. And he wrestles with him to the breaking of the day. It doesn't introduce him that a man or an angel came and he asks him, do you want to wrestle? It doesn't tell us any of that. What you have is a situation that he was left alone and suddenly he's wrestling with someone. How on earth does that kind of situation come about? We're not told that, but he is fighting desperately with this individual and he knows that he has to hold on to him and verse 25 says you know when this man this angel saw that he didn't prevail against him he touched the hollow of his thigh and he, we know that he puts Jacob's thigh out of joint and he says let me go because the sun's almost coming up I won't let you go except you bless me and at this point this is when his name is changed he said what is thy name he said Jacob and he said, thy name shall be called no more, Jacob, the supplanter, the deceiver, Jacob, but Israel, Yisrael, for as a prince hast thou power with God 
and with men and hast prevailed. There's a great symbol in what he did in wrestling with that angel. He knew who he was and he wrestled with him. He must have jumped upon him and says, you won't go. Don't leave me. Deliver me from the face of my brother. Please don't go. And he says, I don't want to leave your presence. And Hosea, let's just go there for a second because it gives us detail that inspired scripture gives us that we do not have in the Genesis record. Because we might think to ourselves, oh, that's this was rather good natured wrestling. You know, there wasn't a lot of emotion. He just says, no, I'm not going to let you go. This was a man, remember, who was greatly afraid and distressed. He thought his whole family was going to be killed. And look at how the, it describes it for us in the inspired word of, of prophecy through Hosea. Hosea chapter 12. Let's read verses 3 and 4, which we know speaks to us of Jacob. That one who took his brother by the heel in the womb and by his strength he had power with God. By his own strength he had power. He had that contention with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He was weeping. He got in a situation where the angel is trying to get off him. We know he could have done so. But because Jacob would not let him go. And as he's wrestling with him, he's weeping. Crying his eyes out because he thinks his whole family is going to be killed in the morning. And he made supplication and said, please don't go. Let me go. I won't let you go. You've got to bless me before you go because my whole family will be killed otherwise. And he found him in Bethel, the house of God. And there he spake with us. And that is how we know, of course, that in the parable of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Jacob represents us because he speaks with us there. Abraham the father, Isaac the son, and Jacob, who was represented as the great multitude. You and I, that is where God wrestled with him. And he wrestled on our behalf, as it seems. It's like the ecclesia of God wrestling. Do we ever do that? Do we have emotion about the scriptures? Do we really weep, desperate for God's blessing, and make supplication for him in prayer? never letting go and hoping that God will bless us and deliver us. Do we have that kind of emotion? Because here's the example of a patriarch. And I'd put it to you that we do have to. And I wonder sometimes if maybe when we get older and we have families and all the things that come upon us in terms of stresses and strains and difficulties, maybe that's when we really feel, as Jacob felt, there with his family in great peril, weeping. Don't let me go. And because of that, he was greatly blessed. And that name, Israel, El at the end is God. The first bit is a verb. Some, the word Sa means a prince, and some have it as just prince with God. The difficulty I have with that is it doesn't just say Sarel, it says Yisrael. There's a Y, a Yod, at the beginning. And if you take a Hebrew verb, and you add a yod at the beginning, it becomes the imperfect tense, the future tense, in the third person masculine. So what it would mean is, he will be prince with God. So I think what he's saying is, this is, this is a prophecy. He says, because of what you've done, you now represent all of those who will hang on for dear life to God. Hang on for the promise that he's given to you. Weeping and making supplication all the way. You won't let go. Even when your legs are a joint. And the frailty of your flesh is caught up with you. And you're weak. You won't let go. Well, you'll be blessed. You will be a prince with God. You'll be the one who contended with God. And prevailed. And so his name was changed. And what's he told? After that happens, what does the record say? He blessed him there. In that very place. And Jacob says, verse 30. Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which our margin tells us is the face of God. So there, in that instant, he had realised, I need to focus on the unseen, the things which truly are real and are eternal, yet are unseen by us. He was focusing on the great challenge of his brother, my face and his face, my face and his face. And then he realises, I've got to hold on to God with all my might. 
That's the hope I've got. That's the hope of the kingdom. That's the hope of being a prince with God, which you will be, Israel. And so he says, I call the name of that place Peniel, the face of God, not the face of Jacob, not the face of Esau, but the face of God. For I have seen God face to face and my life was preserved. He did bless me. He did look after me. And the wonder of that cannot be lost on us in that instance of the wrestling with God. I was preserved. And then he passed over Penuel and the sun rose and he halted on his thigh. But he wasn't worried anymore. He knew that God was with him. He got that blessing. And he looked it up his eyes and he saw Esau coming. And we know how the narrative unfolds before us. That's where our focus has got to be, my dear brothers and sisters, young people. On the face of God. Not on the face of our employer or those who challenge us or on the difficulties of our families, though they be many. We say, let us focus beyond the face of God. Let us weep and make supplication to him and never let the hope of Israel go because that's what Jacob represents here. And so that angel was sent before Israel. And even now, God's saints that are ministered unto by the eyes of Yahweh that run to and fro in all the earth. Flip over to chapter 35, where God appears to Jacob again. And again here, there is a reference to his name being changed to Israel. So Genesis 35 verse 9 and God appeared unto Jacob again and he came out of Paddan Aram and he blessed him and God said unto Jacob said unto him thy name is Jacob thy name shall not be called any more Jacob but Israel shall be thy name and he called his name Israel so this has happened before but it's a reiteration and we know that that's what happens with the promises of God particularly the patriarchs the same promises are expanded upon They're made again, but expanded upon. And what's the expansion we have on the name of Israel? Verse 11, God said unto him, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shalt thou be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. That's what the name of Israel means. Yisrael, you you who will be a prince with God, he who will be a prince with God, well, you're going to be a great nation. You're going to be fruitful and you're going to multiply, Jacob. Nations are going to come out of you. Kings are going to come out of thy loins. And we know that does not just mean the great people of Israel, which came out, the natural Israel. We know Romans 11 is very clear with us. That means all those who have been faithful, Jew or Gentile, who have come to the hope of Israel. That's what Jacob was promised. That's what his name means. A great company of princes with God. Kings shall come out of thy loins. What does Revelation tell us? the hope of being kings and priests and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. Revelation chapter 5. That was what was promised. The great company. Where else are we told that an angels, the group of angels are a great company? We looked at it in some of our earlier studies. Luke chapter 2, verse 13, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it say? A great company of angels. So you have this linkage between Israel and his interaction with the angels and referencing, look, this is what the angels are. That's what you'll be like. A great company of kings with God, just as the angels are. A great company singing for joy at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you'll be part of that great company. Do we really want that? Where is our emotion? My dear brothers and sisters, young people, where's our focus on the face of our foes, those in front of us, on our face, in the mirror, what's happening right now in front of our eyes, or on God's face, God's promises. Because after this blessing is given to Jacob, there's another long period where there's no record of the angels interacting with Israel, with Jacob. About 33 years, another long period of silence. And how did Jacob respond? to all of that Genesis 48 (coughs) this is the summary of this faithful servant of the Lord who in all his terrible difficulties 
And if we ever need to look at those who were faithful through difficulties with family and with jobs and with health and with all of the losses he's faced, surely Jacob is one. And this is his summary at the end of his life when he blesses his sons. Genesis 48. Let's go in at verse 15. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil. Bless the lads and let my name be named on them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And we know the margin has a reference to as fish, as fish increase, so the multitude of Jacob would increase. And so he says, that God that was with my father Abraham and Isaac, he walked with them, so he walked with me. And the angel redeemed me from all evil. Really? Had he redeemed you from all evil, Jacob, in all the difficulties you faced and the loss and the strife and the trial? And then you went on all that time with you, you were lame since you met that angel. And yet in his eyes, he redeemed me from all evil because it was all in the Lord's hand. He went through terrible difficulties, but he said it was in God's hand. He sent the angel to keep me by the way and to bring me into the promised land. That was his summary at the end of his life. And he says he wants that God that did that for him to bless the lads, his children. That the name of Abraham and Isaac will be upon them and they're going to grow into that great multitude. And he must have known that that was beyond his natural descendants, but the great multitude in the midst of the earth, all those who would come to the truth, the light of the word. And that was his summary at the end of his life. How do our own plans and our own schemes and our own designs on our life fit with this? We know that there were times when Jacob tried to move things in his direction. But in the end, he said, look, I look to the face of the Lord. I'll not shrink from his blessing. Come what may, the Lord will send his angel before me to redeem me from all evil. It's all in the hands of the Lord. How much readjustment do we need to make to become like this faithful man with whom God interacted? What can we learn from the difficulties that we face in our life and of course it's easy for any one of us to say to one another oh well we should learn from our experiences well let's not say it to one another let's just look at the example of Jacob and how he learned I want to finish by remembering what our Lord Jesus Christ said to us and picking up Hebrews chapter 13 because I think when we remember what Jesus said it makes more sense what we read in Hebrews chapter 13 Because when we think of God's interaction with us, the angels that keep us in the way and that will bring us to the kingdom if we do let them. Our free will is always assured and we've talked about that in our early studies. But how will we respond to the situations in which God puts us in his mercy, teaching us along the way? But then how do we respond to our brothers and sisters? Don't despise one of these little ones, says Jesus, because they've got angels too. And they behold your father in heaven. So Hebrews 13 says, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Why would it put that verse next to the next verse, which says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels and a wes. A link again is directly made. If you think God's ministering servants who are through the earth, ministering and keeping them in the way to bring them to the promised land, You don't know who they are. You've got to be respectful and entertain them, just as Abraham did. Let brotherly love continue. For those very same ministers which God, being merciful, sends to you, sends to your brothers and sisters, and are working in the earth. So you've got to love your brother and help one another. And what's the context of Matthew 18, when the Lord Jesus Christ quoted that? It's about reconciliation. It's about a brother or a sister who's having difficulties walking in the way and how we're to treat them, to bring them back in love, to reconcile them to the truth. So that's, in the end, what the subject of the angels must teach us. It's God manifestation. It's God saying, here's my promise to you. This is me walking with you in the way, bringing you to the kingdom if you would. So what will you do now you have that knowledge? 
for your brothers and sisters who I'm desperate to keep in the way. Are you keeping them in the way? Are you looking after others? Are you loving your brothers and your sisters? Because we can be rest assured, as Zechariah tells us, that those angels which have been sent out into the earth, we must know, says Zechariah, that Yahweh of hosts has sent them unto us. And we have to develop that eye of faith to know that in our last days before our Lord returns.